two, one. There you go. We're back. Okay. All right. Take, take two, ladies and gentlemen, and like, non-binaries. Verify that we can actually hear everyone this time. Someone in the audience, please, All right. God Almighty, tell me if we did it right this time. So All right. Like, I think you can hear me. I heard myself. Can you hear Chase? That'd be nice if we could actually verify if you can hear me. Okay. Cool. Course, Athens, yeah. Athens said so. Good. They can hear us both now. Yay. Thank you all, all right. for putting up with this crap. <laughs> Hashtag. All right. Six. In my defense, Chase's fault. <laughs> yeah. <All right. laughs> my fault. Let, so let's get started. Uh, round two. Thank you, everybody, for joining us with episode three of the Q&A with Chase. Uh, I call him Chase because that's what the C in CS Joe stands for. So if I ever call him Chase, you know who I'm talking about. Now, him Chase, you know who I'm talking about. Now, okay, uh, some, I'm just going to quickly go over the announcements again. Uh, we're going to have a coaching session with Chase, which we're going to be giving away. Uh, you're going to see this on an Instagram, an Instagram post. To be in, enrolled to get this prize, you're going to need to like the Instagram post. Now, the thing is, even though this is a coaching session, even if your life is great, you can still have an hour session, one-on-one -on -one chat with Chase himself. So if you have any questions from any of the books or the content of his lectures, you have an hour to ask him. Uh, also, another giveaway for the book, King, Warrior, Magician, Lover, The Mature Archetypes for the Masculine. Uh, if you're looking at being in a relationship, that is perhaps one of the uh, archetypes which you will want to look at developing. Uh, and let's get on to some questions, Chase. So, Chase, are you ready? Yeah, I am ready. And I just proved everyone on stream that I'm bad at writing with my right hand because I'm left-handed, actually. So Fake news. Yeah, fake news. Uh, so, yeah, let's go for it. What do, what do you got for me tonight, Jeb? <laughs> All right. Well, what we're going to be doing is carrying over some of the questions we missed last time from last session, just so that everything can get answered. <clears throat> and what I want to start with is someone asked, why do you believe TI logic is logic and TE is rationale? Why can't they be two systems of logic? Uh, because rationale basically is the collective uh, true-false. I mean, and logic is the personal true-false. They're still technically true-false, which I guess rootedly, like, deep down translationally <laughs> with language, and I'm not, like, a linguist. Uh, T-I, T-E is still both about true-false. It's just the perspective of what true-false or the source of true-false, where is it coming from? Is it coming from one's individual self, a single mind, or is it coming from a collection of minds, basically? And that's literally the difference between the two. It's kind of like how I've said this before. You have a, you're at a table in your mind. You have a straight line, and everyone's going true false, you know, until you're going through all 100 of those thoughts. Versus, you know, having 10 tables with 10 lines of thoughts. But instead of 100 thoughts in one line, you're just going to have 10 thoughts each, and they're all going true-false simultaneously, and the majority rules. That's, you know, 60% of the tables said true, so we're going to make the decision, for example. So that's just mm -hmm. basically the difference between logic and rationale. Okay. I am, yeah. F for any context, this is probably relating to the cognitive functions videos Chase has made, so you, his TI and TE videos, which were one of the first few he made. So if you want to see those, go check those out. I think, that's I think I'm going to move one. on to the next question. Yeah, I think that's season yep. one. So, yeah. Cool. So I'm going to move on. This person asked, so since I am marionetting people for selfish gain, I should be more like my ESTP super ego and be upfront and direct with people? Ooh. Question mark. Okay, this is a bit of a long one, so bear with me. Although it's super ego and I'll feel bad for being direct, it would be better to be direct and not be covert? Question mark. How do I make this possible? Question mark. I don't want to be like the NFP. Like, I don't want to be how like the NFPs are. You describe them, and how would I treat people better than manipulating them negatively for selfish gain? Please don't say managing your inferior or nemesis fear and worries because I'm constantly aware of that. 
So should I stop trying to make good impressions so that people can see the real me, the not so good person I'm inside? That's going to be very raw for others and myself. But is that what you are saying, Chase? <clears throat> so, that is a um, lot. Can you give me a better context breakdown of what that means? Can you translate a little bit there, Jeff? <laughs> All right. I think what this person is, they're, they're taking a very negative con uh, connotation around the word manipulation. Whereas right. I think with you, it's just a normal word. So yeah. maybe you could explain how you don't think manipulation is bad and it's just an all social interaction is manipulation, as you usually say. Yeah, exactly. All right. So, so the question is whether or not to be <laughs> like, is am I a bad person if I'm direct when I'm manipulating people is basically what the question is. That's kind of how I took that question. I think this person saying is they don't want to be like a typical NFP, which can be prone to manipulative uh, thought patterns. So, and they're asking if they should be more like their ESTP super ego. Uh, no, uh, it would be advisable to avoid <laughs> being like your super ego. Uh, I, and why would their ESTP super ego be any less, you know, from manipulation? Basically, I, I don't get it. So if we're talking about negative manipulation. This is obviously an ENFP asking this question if they have ESTP super ego, right? So if this is an ENFP ego who's asking this question, literally to avoid being manipulative, what you got to do is you just have to verify your beliefs. And you're obviously not going to do that because, you know, you're a TE child. So you're going to want someone else to help verify your beliefs for you. That way, you know, you're not just marionetting somebody <laughs> with like perceptions and changing and altering the thoughts in other people's heads or their perceptions for your own personal gain, right? It really comes down to why you're doing what you're doing. The why is everything. So why? Why are you conversing with this person? What are you trying to, are you trying to gain something for just yourself or gain something for other people, right? And that's how I would answer that question. What do you think, Jeb? Um, yeah, I definitely, I, I would probably put some more emphasis on the fact that all social interaction is some form of manipulation. And even in a circumstance where the person you're manipulating gets better, gets a better deal than you, you still technically, it's still technically manipulation. So I think it's just the stigma around the word manipulation. Um, if you're afraid about manipulating people, maybe surround yourself with, um, some people, some TI users who can challenge your beliefs. Yeah. That might help. I don't know what you think. Oh, yeah. I completely agree. You want to be around TI users or at least uh, maybe TE heroes because TE heroes also can help uh, TE child uh, adjust their beliefs properly because TI nemesis is still <laughs> enough to verify at times. And TE children can get, can learn under TE heroes pretty well. <coughs> so. I think from an ENFP standpoint, there's an advantage there. But yeah, it, it it's best to surround yourself with as many TI users as possible because they'll challenge you, right? So as iron sharpens iron, so does one man to another. You want to find yourself in a situation where you're challenged in social interactions, which keeps you sharp. And it keeps you sharp enough and also holds you to a higher standard of integrity so that you stay you know, charitable instead of being depraved, AKA like <clears throat> insanely selfish. That's how I would put that. Okay. I think this person actually asked another question because I've got another question in my spreadsheet. So I'm guessing it's from the same person. If you do screw up with people without the intent, which you state NFPs automatically do, <clears throat> I might not use TI to know I am. How do I rectify the situation? Meaning if I screw up with an INFJ, which I already got door slammed, which functions of the four ego can I appeal to to show I'm sorry, like genuinely sorry? Or is that, again, manipulation and I should move on with my life? You have to... No, it's not manipulation. Well, I, again, all social interaction is manipulation of some kind. All, but basically what you have to do is you go to the INFJ and you have to prove your loyalty. You have to absolutely prove your loyalty. Find whatever way possible that there is to prove your loyalty to the INFJ. If they door slammed you 
And the thing is, is that you may not know why they door slammed you. There's obscure reasons why INFJs door slam you. I mean, I was door slammed by an INFJ once, and I didn't even figure out why they door slammed me until years later. And when I found out the reason, I felt really bad because it's like, I wish I'd have saw, I wish I was even paying attention to that, but I wasn't. I was completely oblivious as to the reason behind why I was door slammed by this <laughs> INFJ that I cared about. And, uh, but because I came to realize what the reason was, I now have the opportunity to go back to that person and potentially re-interface with them and prove my loyalty again, which may cause them to finally be comfortable in having a conversation with me or much less treat me like a human being, you know, because the door slam, the way it works is that INFJs are just kind of like, oh, well, you're dead to me and you're not human anymore. So I'm just going to move on. Or it's more <laughs> like, I need you out of my life because I can't handle the emotional trauma of you being in it because you just constantly remind me of all the negative in our relationship because you're like this walking totem that stores all these memories of mine. You know, so that, that's how I would answer that question. <clears throat> uh -huh. Okay. Now, I think I've seen you answer this question before, and there's a, it's kind of a loaded question, but this person asks why you use MBTI when they consider Big Five to be more accurate and up-to-date. <laughs> Answering this question yet again, uh, Big Five is very nurture-based. It's very human nurture. Uh, I, I actually recently retook the Big Five test for uh, myself recently because a member of the Discord community asked me to very politely and nicely. And I said, sure, I'll do it. But otherwise, like, I'd probably never going to do it again. But the point is, uh, Big Five, it you can't, just like in Neogram, you can't tell the difference. You can't tell the difference between, uh, you know, human nature and human nurture because... There's just too many questions where it's just kind of like left up to interpretation. Also, the MBTI is just a test. I don't care about the MBTI. I care about Jungian analytical psychology, also known as depth psychology. That's what I care about. That's what the science of the MBTI is based on. So when people say I'm MBTI, I'm not actually. It's depth psychology. The MBTI is just a test and I have nothing to do with the MBTI. I just use the four letters because that's what the most common labels that people use for the 16 archetypes and also has really good SEO. But otherwise, that's the only reason I use them. If I didn't have to use them, I wouldn't use them. So anyway. Yep. I mean, yeah, uh, you've already explained this before. So let's just go on to the next question. Do you believe in the phrase, no one deserves anything? Explain. Do I believe in the phrase, no one deserves anything? Uh, not really. We have this thing called <laughs> due process in law. And due to due process, that would infer that people actually are capable of deserving things. So it's just that, again, that's all about a belief. And it's very subjective. And who maintains that belief? And who gets to judge, you know, who deserves what, basically? Because, you know, who are you to judge your neighbor? But at the same time, we have to be human beings and agree on something because we don't exactly have a deity that's actively uh, intervening in human civilization on a daily basis, you know, passively. Okay. We can make that argument for passively, but actively we don't. So in the meantime, it's up to us human beings to try to figure that out together. Yep. I mean, yeah, it's quite an open-ended question. You could answer that for days, but, Let's just keep it short for now. Uh, another question. How does TI nemesis, nemesis affect a dominant TE user like an ENTJ or an ESTJ? Uh, they are worried about what they think. Uh, they worry that what they think is not actually true. So they have to go to other people to ask, hey, what do you think about this? They're asking other people for verification so that uh, they're basically verifying what they believe is true. And... Uh, and while they can, if they spend a lot of time, they can definitely come to know things that are true from a logical standpoint. They have the capability within TI Nemesis and even TI Critic can, but it takes a lot more effort and a lot more time than just a regular TI user. A TI user being somebody who has TI logic in the top four functions of their mind, essentially. Uh, okay. Uh, do EPs get confused more for introverts than EJs? 
Uh, no, because that's not how confusion works. All types are capable of receiving confusion. And also, what kind of confusion? Are you talking about rationale? Are you talking about morality? Are you talking about ethics or logic? There's different kinds of confusion, and it's mm -hmm. too broad to ask, hey, you know, what letters do this? What letters do that? We can't do that. Yep. Okay. Uh, let's go on to this one. Uh, this, okay, this some context. This relates to male and female, how it differs between the archetypes. So if there are different... So if there are differences between male and female, can you speak to the mental activity in the 32 types? I think with that meaning 16 male, 16 female. Yeah, sure. Uh, it, it really comes down to priority. Uh, so males or the masculine will say typically are focused on the big things of life, uh, like fighting a war or, you know, getting a, a giant pay cut or going out and slaying dragons and conquering things, etc. Whereas the feminine is more focused on the little things of life. And uh, there's just different priorities. I'm not to say, it's not to say that women don't prioritize big things either because they can, but it's more of a secondary trait. And it's not to say that men can't prioritize the little things either. It's just a secondary trait. Children would count as a little thing not a big thing per se in the eyes of the masculine, mm -hmm. whereas in the eyes of the feminine, it's the opposite. And it's because of those difference in priorities. When you look at each of the different types, uh, you know, 16 for masculine, 16 for feminine, uh, it's like, okay, great. This ENTJ prioritizes big things as primary with secondary with little things of life. And then this, uh, um, this female ENTJ prioritizes the little things primarily with the secondarily approach, secondary approach of, you know, the big things. If you need to find out more about that, watch season 13. It's a playlist on this YouTube channel. And uh, that should explain a little bit more about how masculine and feminine work from like prioritization. But that's basically how I would answer that question. So the TLDR is they mature differently. <laughs> Well, yeah, or they, they organize their life differently or uh, things that are important to them are not as important to <laughs> other types of a different gender. It's kind of like, this is why I completely disagree with Warren Farrell in his book, The Boy Crisis, where he's talking about how we have to mandate schools to teach little boys emotional intelligence. Excuse me, but why the hell am I going to teach an ISTP or an INTP boy emotional intelligence and force them to go through that process, which is technically actually psychologically abusive to the children? Why am I going to do that in school? But apparently Warren Farrell thinks it's okay. Uh, and <laughs> yeah, it must be okay then. Yeah, so it, it must be okay. I mean, you know, the guy who decided that he wanted to run for governor of California at one point in time. So, yeah. <sighs> Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. This question asked, I think it's referring to intellectual capability. So it asks, can you speak, can you speak to mental activity in the 16 types? So are there types that are more likely to be more intelligent? Uh, not necessarily. Uh, I know some ESFPs uh, who are absolutely brilliant. I know ESFJs that are absolutely brilliant. I know an ESFJ physicist who's developed their INTP subconscious so well, uh, which also, interestingly enough, they're transgendered. Uh, and because of that rapid development of their INTP subconscious they and their approach to physics, uh, they have been able to do some crazy, amazing things. And they've also won a lot of awards and they work for a tech giant here in Silicon Valley. So it really doesn't have much to do. I, I guess statistically, maybe you could do a study and find out. But then again, how are you going to deploy a study when so many people are mistyped anyway, if you know mm -hmm. what I mean? So it's not exactly right. something that would be ideal. So effectively, it's easier for, say, the NT types to become intellectually higher, whereas the say SF types will require maturity with their subconscious. You'd say that again. So what? I, uh, so what I'm getting from your question is that with NT types, it's easier because they're just using their ego. Whether, whereas with SF types, they have to develop their subconscious. Ab absolutely, yes. Thank you for bringing that up. Because, for example, you take take an SJ or an ESTJ. We'll say uh, an ESTJ. They 
they're really good at athletics growing up. They're, they're super good in school and uh, they just handle things, you know, with in a physical realm in a very sensing way. And they're absolutely fantastic. And then the older they get, they become this crazy philosopher, uh, INFP like person very integrated with their ESTJ ego as they get older and they get in the middle age and they care th about things in that direction more so than just athletics, for example. Whereas with someone like an INTP, uh, they may start out more focused on the abstract and not really capable of being athletic. But I know some INTPs, for example, that are in their 50s and they started powerlifting and they're really good at hiking. I know one guy that's an INTP and he discovered rock climbing and he thinks it's the greatest thing ever, for example. And it's because of his ESFJ subconscious, for example. And it's interesting because while he's rock climbing, he's having discussions about theoretical physics. And it's like, wow, dude, <laughs> I want to go on these more often. You know what I mean? So. It's kind of cool how people integrate their subconscious as they get older. Okay. Uh, I'm going to go away from the spreadsheet and I want to go to a question in the live chat. Sure. Wishbone is, Wishbone is asking, I have just one question. As an ISTP, I'm married to an ENFJ. We have conflict most days. Is it possible that we can work out better? If so, how? So he's an ISTP married to an ENFP. <laughs> looking for marriage ENFJ. Advice. Oh, an ENFJ. An ISTP married to an ENFJ? Ooh. That's rough. If that's actually truly their type pairings, I would verify if that's actually their types. I don't know if that's true or not. It's probably the ENFJ is actually an ENFP or the ISTP might be like an ISTJ instead. There's a possibility that they're mistyped. But I'm not entirely sure if that's uh, the case, but assuming that's true, that'd be a very hard relationship. That's like two people, you know, they, in order to meet and come together, they have to both climb this giant, huge mountain. And they're both starting at the opposite end of this mountain. And they have to go all the way up and climb really hard to get to the top. And that's just, it's pure insanity. It, it would be really rough. Uh, the amount of maturity it takes to maintain a duality relationship, as they call it in socionics, it's a lot of effort and it is a lot of maturity. So definitely not somebody I would recommend getting married to. But, uh, you know, there's a lot of people out there where in certain cultures uh, where somehow it works out. But even then, uh, I bet I think I think someone did a study on this. So I'm not really sure, but or there a study exists, I think, where they were trying to look at it from a socionic standpoint to look at duality and 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 divorce. And I'll have to look that up and actually share that with this audience at one point in time. But uh, that study, I think, is very telling in terms of how duality is just not really something of a kind of relationship that would last long term or so, or a relationship that I would really be willing to invest in because quite frankly it's best if sjs are with sps and nts are with nts and nfs are with nfs like statistically speaking um but that's a very broad brush we can actually get down to cognitive functions and talk about romantic compatibility but that's another mm -hmm. discussion for another time okay so the tldr is for that relationship to work it's going to require a lot of maturity. Um, yeah. Now, another a, a person asked a question. It kind of relates to the male and female and the 32 types, but it's more specific. It asks the difference between a male and a female INTP. Um, I, I mean, it's, it's almost a little too subjective for me to answer, to be honest, because like... Mm -hmm. in which culture and what age group there's there's so many additional nurtural questions that i really don't know again i'll just mm -hmm. refer back to watch season 13 of this youtube channel <laughs> and understand the differences between the masculine and the feminine and that should answer that question all right we got another question here have you read the neuroscience of personality do you recommend it if so, do you recommend any other neuroscientific studies that are relevant? Uh, I have not read that book. 
I would be willing to read that book, but I've not read it now. So I don't. You want me to put a note down, add to your book list? Yes, please do. <clears throat> add to book list. All right. So now this is another question. I think you could answer this quite concisely. How long are people in their super ego state for? Uh, that depends on the situation that they're in. Uh, I was in my super ego state probably for a couple of days when I made changes uh, as necessary. You got to look at the super ego as something that you call upon as as needed, essentially. If you're using it healthily, right? You go into your super ego, you get a task done or a series of tasks done, and then you come out of your super ego. Uh, but you're also like just when you're when you're in your four sides of your mind, you're bouncing back and forth between the different sides of your mind on a daily basis. So you could actually be in your super ego for a few seconds, for example, and as much as you could be in your ego for like a five minute period, then go into your uh, subconscious for 30 seconds and back into your ego. Like there's a lot more microtransactions with cognitive transitions than people realize. It's not just this whole state of, oh, I'm stuck in this type for, you know, five days in a row. It's not, it doesn't look like, it doesn't work like that. It's more of, a bunch of microtransactions between the four sides of your mind and you're bouncing all around. And it's just that you're primarily in your ego the majority of the day. If you're going to look at an entire day's cycle of, you know, statistically of when you're actually in the other sides of your mind. So if you're to look at that graph. Okay. Yep. That seems pretty reasonable. Um, can the super ego take over permanently if they are unhealthy or mentally ill? Absolutely. Yes, they can. Yes, it can. Do you want to elaborate on that at all? Like an example of this? Uh, extreme trauma uh, or really bad microbiome uh, that infests your brain and changes your brain chemistry and how your brain works, which mm -hmm. does happen. Like, for example, multiple sclerosis is linked with H. pylori overgrowth in the gut. And H. pylori breaks your blood-brain barrier and it fests your brain, which causes lesions on your brain. So if you don't want to mm -hmm. get MS, you better make sure your gut health is good. So handle your gut health. Same thing goes with the virus known as varicella. Uh, varicella comes from chicken pox or herpes. And uh, it can also break your blood-brain barrier and infest your central nervous system and give you similar MS-like symptoms. So those are just attack vectors for various bacteria and that can happen to your brain and change your personality and adjust it in such a way where your super ego actually becomes your new ego. There's also been uh, evidence shown that when it comes to the four sides of the mind and people get into like almost deadly car accidents, but they survive, you know, those car accidents and they're a completely different person after the, the collision after it took place, for example. And uh, mm -hmm. it's like they're a completely different person. Same body, just different person. You know what I mean? It's because they're in a different, they're permanently stuck in a different side of their mind as a result of that trauma. Okay. Um, what an example, I know, I think you've used the Joker as an example of an ENTP in his ESFP super ego. Like, yeah. is that a good example? Yeah, it's a great example. It's chaotic Perfect. evil. Chaotic evil. All right. I'm going to take one, another question from the YouTube live chat. This comes from Stefania 11. So how can you be sure if someone's their type or one of their subtypes? Subtypes in what context? Are we talking like, I think, I think like, she's referring like, if, how do you know if someone's in, how do you know if, if you type someone, how do you know if the type you type them as is their ego, their subconscious, their super ego, based their shadow? on, based on how, how much they are based on their interaction style and their temperament style and how long they've been in that throughout like a day, for example, or even an hour, just pick a X amount, just pick a time and watch how they behave primarily. That's it. Right. So get a larger sample size of trying to type them as opposed yep. to typing them on the spot when they're upset. Yep. Okay. Perfect. So, if an individual who has a strong moral FI child function slipped into their unconscious, subconscious, or superego state, which didn't have a moral function, would they disregard their own morals entirely? Uh, yeah, technically they could, although not their subconscious. Their subconscious would still have morality, uh, but it's when mm -hmm. they are in their unconscious or their superego. Yes, temporarily they could ignore their moral behavior 
Absolutely. Mm -hmm. They're more. Right. Awareness. Okay. Uh, all right. How can I help a person possibly stuck in a phase of suffering from strong cognitive dissonance, dissonance and very illusory perception of oneself and lead him back on the path to his own personal development? It sounds like an INFJ or an INJ asking on behalf of an INP. <laughs> That's what that sounds like. Uh, yeah, I'm seeing a lot of effort here. I, 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 can, I can tell you that it's not to like punching them in the face is not going to help. I can tell you that. <laughs> uh, basically, you have to make them uncomfortable. If you're in a relationship with that person, you should probably throw them in the dumpster right away and move on because they're not going to change. If someone's stuck in their comfort zone dreamland for that long, it's kind of already too late and there's nothing you can do except move on and be with somebody else who's actually healthier than that person. Hashtag have self-respect and please move on <laughs> uh, because like it's not going to change. You're just enabling that person. Like don't enable that person. Move on. Seriously, move on. Otherwise, uh, mm -hmm. make them uncomfortable. Tell them how they're dishonoring you and dishonoring their family because they're just more focused on their comfort zone and how they feel without giving any thought towards how other people are feeling or how, uh, or how other people are uncomfortable as a result of their behavior, for example. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that seems pretty reasonable with this next question however this seems to take into account that you've previously said how as a child you were a different type and then as you got older you changed so this is to do with the nurture uh, relationship mm -hmm. between children and the four sides of their mind and how that changes sure. just some context for the audience um and this person is asking is it possible to tailor an environment for changing your children's type to a different one in their quadra Yes, technically, not something I would recommend, no, because if you tailor the environment too much, if you go overboard with tailoring the environment, you are at risk of forcing their minds to go into their unconscious side, which will freeze the position of their ego. So I would recommend not tampering with the child's psyche like that at all and just allow things to naturally play out as they are. That's responsible parenting. I mean, doesn't this go back to the previous question where um, the boy crisis, the author wanted to ch teach male children feelings or something? Yeah, emotional intelligence. Try and and be, by the way, how do you define emotional intelligence? That's like very subjective, and the societal standard of what we believe collectively is emotional intelligence. I mean, society is not even aware of the difference between ethics and morals, much less logic and rationale. So, where the hell does society get off, especially the Warren Farrells of the world, <laughs> from making that judgment for all of us anyway? Like, no, like no. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, I don't trust them either. So let's uh, let's go on to the next question. In your new video, you well, this probably won't be a new video now. Uh, you talk about implementing the dichotomies of affiliative versus pragmatic and concrete versus abstract. Isn't isn't it that simply F versus T and S versus N? So in other words, aren't you simply reverting to how the MBTI measures time? Uh, well, technically yes, but I mean a lot of people don't know the definitions of what those things mean anyway. And why would we just not think for ourselves and allow the test to dictate to us how we're making those judgments? I think it's more valuable for people to actually understand the temperament styles and understand the interaction styles so they can use the type grid in order to type themselves and others without relying on a test, which is notoriously inaccurate. So inaccurate to the point where you have people like Ty Lopez who has a very large uh, you know, following in social media, for example, and he's constantly bashing the MBTI and giving the MBTI a bad rap on a regular basis, and then people believe him, and then they start believing him that the Hexaco test is like really good, et cetera, and when in reality, it's just a human nurture pile of crap. Ooh, we're going to test this person and see how narcissistic they are so we can decide on whether or not we're going to hire them. Yeah, that's actually way too subjective. And oh, by the way, that's discrimination. How about we just throw you in the dumpster? <laughs> 
Uh, yeah. So I see some hypocrisy right there, criticizing other tests when their own test is terrible. But let's. I think that's enough of that. Let's move on to the next question. So you said in your how optimistic or pessimistic pessimistic are the cognitive functions question mm. mark video that you were stuck in your shadow for a long time and didn't get into your ego until the age of 26. Does that mean someone with a traumatic upbringing and coming of age can functionally mistake their shadow functions for their ego functions? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I don't think you need any more elaboration on that. I think that's no. pretty straightforward. Yeah, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, okay, this next question. What is SI? Some say it's memory, some say it isn't. Do you have any elaboration on SI other than watch the video? So introverted sensing is basically one side of the same coin with extroverted sensing is the other side and is the sensing coin, right? So it's all about sensing. All about. So extroverted sensing is your mind's ability to access or interpret what memory you have in the short term. Introverted sensing is your mind's ability to access and interpret your memory from the long term. So all it is is just accessibility. It's accessing your mind's data. And it has it has memory available, and then it has short-term memory as long-term memory. And it's just that our brains, our psyches, are just prefer to access one side more often than the other of this coin of sensing, basically. So when it comes to memory, uh, like extroverted sensors, they prefer to access short-term memory, whereas introverted sensors prefer to access long-term memory. And that's that's all it is. It's just awareness of you know the short-term versus the long-term in their memory. That's all it is. Mm -hmm. All right, we're going to. I think we're going to move back to some YouTube questions now. Yeah, I can see that. I realize uh, that Jess Lee is <laughs> saying, "Answer my questions." LOL. So <laughs> we, pro we probably should do that for her. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, I've actually got her question right here. If you want to answer that right now, go for it. I don't even know what it is. Her question is: What are the ISFPs naturally gifted at besides artistic endeavors? Uh, super high moral behavior. Uh, they're naturally gifted at sales. Uh, they're also really good at getting people uh, to develop systems, uh, systems and ways of doing things, especially uh, mechanical systems and how that works. Uh, they're very... Uh, they can operate heavy machinery pretty well, let's be honest. Uh, <laughs> that's se parent uh, they also have the ability yep. to like look at any physical object it could be a landscape it could be a pile of legos it could be a wall and see something that just doesn't exist yet and then they can literally carve it out or change it or manipulate the physical environment in such a way where it's either more useful helpful it makes them feel good it gives other people a good experience or it's just playing a better way or a more effective way or a more efficient way of doing things <laughs> isfps are very good at identifying efficiencies and making things efficient just like istps are but they just do it in a different way and for a different reason right so and they do it from a more process oriented approach Whereas ISTPs do it from a more practical uh, approach. You know, here's how's the quickest way that I can solve this problem. Whereas ISFPs is more like, well, what's the process that I can follow to solve this problem that would be the best process, basically. So it's a little bit different between the two of them. Okay. Yeah, that seems pretty good. Um, we're going to move on to the next question, which is by Abby V. Growing up. Okay, now this is a question. I'm going to just reword it myself. So can growing up with a family with high sensing weaken your NI? So can senses affect your ability to use your intuitive functions? Uh, yes, they can. If they're trying to get you to behave like them, absolutely. That is, that is definitely something that can happen. I had the benefit of having an ENFJ as a father. So luckily, intuition was not necessarily trampled upon in my family since my sister is an ESFJ and my mother is an ISFJ. So 
it was nice to be able to have some kind of freedom with the intuitive realm uh, based on my father. But there are uh, there are some families like, for example, my mentor's family. His father was an ESTP. His mother was an ESTJ. His sister is an ISTP. His other sister is an ENTP and he's an INFJ. And uh, it, it, and he's the firstborn. Right. So that was pretty difficult being in sensor land, uh, you know, as an INFJ in that regard, because you know, it was too high of an any for his father's any demon to be able to, or ni for his any demon to put up with. So too much ni for that any demon, and even too much ni for that any child of his mother. And his mother, you know, because they're ESTJs, they can kind of be a bit controlling, especially with INFJs, because it's like they're constantly afraid of what the INFJ would want to do next, basically. So yeah, definitely that can be a problem. But again, that can all be corrected with just growing up and moving out of your house and not having failure to launch syndrome and being like a responsible and mature human being. So you can get away from your family if they're like trying to make you into them and inhibit you as a person. So that's how I would solve that problem because your mind will naturally repair itself. So the TLDR for that is if your parents are senses and you're an intuitive, get a forklift license and get your own place. Exactly. <laughs> get your own place like seriously that uh, there's a, i mean you know jordan peterson's got the lobster right i got the forklift because i'm the guy that's going to tell you that if you're 18 and you're working minimum wage uh all you have to do is get like 200 bucks go get osha certified osha certified on a forklift and then you automatically are hireable even with no experience at like 15 bucks an hour and then after a year of that job just go to a temp agency and they'll hire you like that you're making 15 bucks an hour you get your own place get your own car just off of that and you're 18 you don't even have a freaking college degree or whatever and then after a year of that you get paid 20 bucks an hour at amazon for with benefits like why would you not want to do that it's super easy and it doesn't have to be just a forklift license there are other certifications that you can get where it's like you just get the cert you're insta hireable and then you're making a lot more making you're making double than what you're making at working for starbucks or whatever the hell or or mcdonald's or <laughs> or being like a waiter at a restaurant. So get your life in order, seriously, especially men who is listening to this or watching this, get your life in order. If you're 18 and you're making minimum wage, you're doing it wrong. I mean, if I could jump in there, I wouldn't say Jordan Peterson has the lobster thing. I would say, well, and you have the fork thing. I'd say Jordan Peterson has the lobster thing. You have, sorry, Jordan Peterson has the clean your room thing. You have the get your own place. <laughs> yeah, get your own place. That's right. <laughs> Seriously, I wish I didn't stumble around that so much. Yeah, it but. happens. I mean, seriously, yeah. get your own place. I mean, uh, it's like the biggest turnoff for women to be like, oh, this guy, he's so cute. <laughs> you know, he's so dope at the bar. And then, yeah, I live with my parents. Wow, dude. Wow. <laughs> Epic <laughs> fail. Dumpster. Uh, all right. Let's move on to the next question. We've got a question from Hunter. What can I do as an ENTJ to make my environment something I can grow and start jumping on the opportunities I'm seeing? I feel like I'm living on, in my shadow while at home. Well, I think this might relate to what we just discussed. Uh, how can you change your environment? How about get out of your environment? Like when I, uh, I spent a lot of time at the library, right? Because then I could read books. Because you know what's interesting about people? They think for some reason that they have to go to school or get an education to like learn something. No, you don't. Just go to the freaking library. Find a subject that's interesting and read about it and just focus on that one subject. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might, right? I mean, that's like biblical. The point is just figure out something and study it. Once you know, you know, and then you're an expert in that. I mean, that's what I did with this science. I studied it and I studied it out of desperation. I was trying to save my marriage. I failed. But I came out with it with a huge skill, right? And now I help other people's with it, help help other people with their marriages on a regular basis. Hell, I even tell, and in fact, actually, I tell people to divorce each other in as much as I tell them to stay in their marriage, for example. So it's it's kind of a 50-50 shake depending on their situation. But the bottom line is. It, it, you're you are responsible for your own personal growth. If you haven't watched my uh, my playlist season on the YouTube channel about the four pillars of self intimacy, you probably should. 
because that will help you change your environment and change your priorities so that you get off your ass and actually make yourself valuable and, you know, make something work. Otherwise <laughs> you're, you're at risk of being, you know, a mama's boy living in your parents' home and like you wake up and you're the 31 year old virgin. So oh. you don't want to be that guy. And I, right. honestly, I know people like that. Don't be like those people, please. <laughs> Right, and if I could add some more context to your statement about just going and learning something at the library. I mean, I always got – well, it's during – well, I've studied a degree in engineering. I've got a master's degree, and I remember always talking to my friends saying, what the hell is the point of paying so much for this degree when the only thing that we end up getting out of it is the accreditation? I realistically didn't feel like the teachers were teaching me much and that I basically just self-taught everything and then just proved it on a test to get that accreditation. and. You know, yeah. there's a fine line between whether you can do something and whether you have that accreditation. That's that's exactly that's exactly after me. I went to DeVry University in Fremont, California. That is my alma mater. Okay, and let me tell you something. There is only three, maybe four, three and a half classes worth taking there uh, in my curriculum uh, for my major, which was business information systems, and that was accounting. I cannot tell you how valuable accounting is. And that was like probably the most valuable class. Game theory uh, with a professor who also went to Berkeley, which is kind of interesting because I didn't know that they even taught game theory there in that manner. Uh, she was doing it from an economic and legal standpoint. So it was kind of interesting. And then systems analysis class, which was great to understand how systems work in, in as much as cultural systems and the metaphysical as well as the physical. And the other class was basically stats. You know, outside of that, the rest of it, I just kind of made it up as I went. And I ended up graduating with $120,000 in debt, which ended up landing me homeless for two years. <laughs> Yay. So, but I didn't default. So, thank God. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm going on to the next question by V Strategy. Well, since you're an ENTP, you probably have the most hands-on experience with this question. What are the best businesses for ENTPs to start? And what are they good at, i.e. sales, strategy, et cetera? Uh, the best business that an ENTP could start would be a consulting business and consulting in areas of sales, absolutely. Uh, consulting areas in social engineering, uh, marketing is a big one for ENTPs, even engineering as well. You just have to get mm -hmm. really, really good at a skill and then know how to market said skill and then perform said skill. That's all there is to it. It's, just, it's an easy system. It, it, it's like uh, input, process, output, feedback. Just keep doing that over and over again and you'll be successful. <laughs> Right, but are you worried about, you know, ENTPs, you know, being a starter type, getting bored and then failing? Like, do you have any suggestions as to how this person can get out of that loop of yes. starting and then failing? Thank you for bringing that up. Yes, you're right. Uh, so here's, here's what you have to do as an ENTP. You have to have an executive team. You have to have people that you're willing to die for, essentially, as, as, as friends and people that you trust to be a part of your executive team and to get you through the day-to-day -day and delegate them. Uh, there is one particular um, ENTP, and I can't believe I'm talking about him right now, but you know what, Jeb? What the hell? His name is, uh, and you know him, Jeb, his name is Alexander Jean Turco, and uh, he, uh, he plays video games uh, for a living, <laughs> but uh, this guy understands delegation and he's an ENTP. Forbes uh, did a ma magazine article on him. Actually, a lot of people did uh, articles on him. He had a blog for a while, but uh, this guy, he just really understands delegation. When an ENTP can master the art of delegation, which if you're an ENTP and you haven't read Robert Greene or Dale Carnegie, you probably should. So you can learn how to properly delegate to people. But delegation is literally everything you need to know. So upon delegating, like 
you have you're able to get your executive team and you're able to accomplish anything and just keep casting the vision while the people that you delegate tasks to can handle it identify those tasks prioritize those tasks delegate those tasks trust them to do that because leadership is defined this way all leadership is is a transfer of power from yourself to other human beings and then you just hold them accountable that's all leadership is that's it. So as an ENTP, you need to take the Steve Jobs approach where he says, I play the orchestra. And he said that like Michael Fassbest, Michael Fassbender playing Steve Jobs and the recent Steve Jobs film explains that to Seth Rogen's portrayal of Steve Wozniak. And uh, that is very telling because that's how expert intuition and Effie Child work from a management standpoint with TE Critic, right? And so again, the secret to ENTP success is delegation. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, definitely. Um, let's see. Let's see which question I should choose next. Ah. So Valentina Belovsky, how can I work better to get along with my parents? They're both ENFP, which is the same type as her. What are the main conflicts that come from having the same type as your parents? So three NFPs. Yeah, I don't believe her. And I think they're all mistyped. <laughs> so mm -hmm. please learn the type grid and verify that. Uh, otherwise, if there really was a family with three ENFPs in that way, uh, run for the hills, uh, grow up quickly and get your own <laughs> place and get out. Uh, maybe throw yourself in the dumpster just to get away. <laughs> no, right. and, and, and by the way, I am not here who gives, uh, I'm not someone who gives medical advice or <laughs> I am not a therapist. So take that with many grains of salt, but, but seriously, uh, no, that's, that's not a healthy situation at all for sure. But I also don't mm -hmm. believe that there are three ENFPs anyway. So I can't exactly answer that question <clears throat> properly. Right. Well, she asked another question, so hopefully she's, if she's unsatisfied with that answer, you can satisfy her on this answer. Are uh, ENFPs prone to being codependent in relationships? If so, why? Uh, it's because they're too comfortable. It's because they're not willing to let go of the comfort that they have within their relationship. And they're more just, you know, the, the risk involved with trying to start a new relationship and starting over and building up all of that is way more effort than actually the dealing with the breakup themselves. So then they'll just put up with the negativity because their main needs of being comfortable with their SI inferior are being met, basically. And that's why. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that pretty much answers it all. I've got nothing more to say. Um, how can I improve SE Inferior and what is SE Inferior about? SE Inferior is basically performance anxiety. And to get over SE Inferior, you have to perform over and over and over and over and over and fail a million times and fail a million times more and embarrass yourself even more than that until you finally get it right and there is no more anxiety because you've performed so much and you know exactly every possible reaction your audience when you perform whatever task, be it for your boss, could be your audience or it could be a bunch of people on stage, it could be a sexual encounter in the bedroom, whatever, you just keep doing it over and over and over again. SE Inferior literally is performance anxiety, but you can literally beat that anxiety out of existence by not giving up and keep trying over and over and over, Naruto style. Right. Okay. All right. Someone asked, I'm not sure what they mean, but I'm an INTP, just wondering, will the perfect time, perfect time in quotations, come? Uh. No, it won't. The perfect time will not come. You should probably take action now and uh, see how it goes. Because the longer you wait, uh, the more opportunity you're actually missing. And you're missing out on failure. And you need failure to get wisdom so that you can like grow and be more effective than you were. But because you're not even willing to make mistakes, you're not going to grow anywhere. And basically, that means you're becoming a worthless human being. So make sure <laughs> that you take time and actually mm -hmm. fail so you're not worthless and you're actually able to contribute to other people and uh you know because it's not about motivation besides if anyone's trying to motivate an intp that intp is going to consider it as like manipulation
manipulation, you know? So maybe you should just force yourself to do things, whether you like it or not, and whether you're comfortable with it or not, uh, because then you're going to grow and then you're actually going to get things done. And then you can realize, oh, wow, this wasn't actually so bad. I, it's not going to be as bad as I thought it was. And then all of a sudden you realize you're going to be much more stronger human being than you were before. It's all about self-discipline. Do not do what you want, INTPs. Do what you should do. The thing is you have to figure out what it is you actually should do, right? It's all about duty at the end of the day. It's all about honor. If you're going to sit around and like stick, stay in your comfort zone all day long, you're actually dishonoring yourself and you're dishonoring people. You're dishonoring your own family. You are basically dishonoring your race to a point. You're dishonoring other INTPs and contributing to the stereotypes that are happening to INTPs on a regular basis, including being told they're autistic or have Asperger's or whatever. So anyway. Oh, actually, there was a question about that. Um, let me just find it. Well, I think the person said they had an ESTJ mother who thinks they're autistic when they're actually they're just an INTP. Do you have any uh, – how, how can he convince his mother that he's not autistic or has Asperger's? Sorry, it was Asperger's. How to convince somebody that they don't have Asperger's? Right. So they have a ES, – I think it was an ESTJ mother who thinks they have Asperger's because they're an INTP. Okay, so go get evaluated by um, multiple professionals and get like quadruple professional opinions. And if just one of them says no, that's all the evidence you need to say like, yeah, I don't have it. If one person disagrees, then I mean, it can't be true. <laughs> so even if you have 10 people saying you do and one you don't, that's it's right. good enough for you? Good enough. Right. <clears throat> Okay, um, that seems for the most part. Uh, let's go back to the spreadsheets. All right. How has cognition impacted the development of Western philosophy? How do we determine what propositions and theories are more correct in face of what seems to be a reflection of underlying cognitive processes and thus inherent bias? Um, uh, we're not ever going to get away from bias of society and also bias from the fact that 70% of the population mm -hmm. are concrete censors. Sorry, we're not going to get away from that. Not only that, there's arguments, uh, that was made by someone on the discord server, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, some people know who she is, but she basically explained to me that she had heard or maintains that, you know, if you live on the eastern side of the hemisphere of the planet, you're more, there's a higher chance of being an intuitive type than you would be on the western side of the hemisphere, which is more of an S uh, hemisphere. I thought that was very interesting, and I'm pondering that. But assuming if that's true or even false, regardless, it doesn't matter. But, but, if the possibility at least exists, uh, then, you know, geographical location could also play in a part of it pretty seriously, you know, and to be fair, I actually have met a lot of intuitive Australians, even though Australia is a very SFP culture, to be honest, you know, so I, it's kind of like, well, <clears throat> not, right. it, it just changes. It just, it, it all depends really. Okay. All right. So let's go to this question. How does the positive side of a function look like if you described every second negative? And how does the picture relate? Does it have a positive side to it as well? What? I don't. I don't <laughs> yeah. It. How does uh, the positive way side over of a function my look head. like? So this goes, I think this goes back to you describe how the functions act with positive and negative and i think what this is asking is how do the po positive functions of this how does it picture so i think this is to do with the fact that some functions in your stack are positive and some are negative and how do they relate to each other uh, I would say watch my lectures on uh, cognitive <laughs> functions being optimistic or pessimistic. That would be how I'd answer that for sure. Yeah. Also, also <laughs> watch my videos. Yeah. Also watch the lectures on cognitive synchronicity uh, as well. I believe that's season five. Uh, 
very important. A lot of people don't know how the cognitive functions interact with each other. And season five outlines synchronicity. It's very important. There's even synchronicity between the sensing functions. It's not just some metaphysical voodoo intuitive thing. This is actually, it, it happens to concrete people in as much as it happens to everyone else. Okay. Uh, let's go on to this next question. Are uh, ENFJs normally detached from their emotions? And is it a common thing for people to either project their feelings onto them or think that they're emotionally more emotionally than they actually are? Uh, ENFJs are very emotional and, uh, their own emotions, they do have their own emotions. It's FI nemesis in terms of like, and by the way, I'm not saying like FI is equal to emotion. Like FE can come out with an emotion. Like emotion is not the same as feelings. Feelings are decisions, decisions where a person decides something is a good or bad thing. An ENFJ is always aware of their emotions because they have FE hero, right? And they also have FI nemesis. And when it comes to their own personal feelings, it's more of they're just worried that they're a bad person. It's kind of always negative and they're not good enough or they're not worthy enough per se. Whereas with the FE, it's more of like, okay, well, how worthy are other people? What do other people deserve, right? Awareness of what people deserve is actually a very FE thing. It's not an FI thing. Although sometimes people are like, well, I deserve this. And it could be an FI user, but it's usually them using a lower, more critical FE function when they're saying, I deserve this. And otherwise, it's like, you deserve this. And that's more of a, uh, it's a higher FE uh, thing. So... Hopefully that answers that question. That's kind of like out there. Okay. Um, this should be like a quick like sentence answer. Which cognitive functions have the relationship to create creativity? Uh, all of them. <laughs> okay. Uh, somebody's asking if you can publish your video schedule or maybe just a list of videos you would like to upload. I will never publish my schedule and I will never publish what's coming up ahead of time. You will never get that from me. Nope. <laughs> I am an ENTP. Nope. I am chaotic neutral. Uh, that is not going to happen. Uh, they come out in the way they what? come out. Like the reason why my schedule is the way it is. And I do have a loose schedule, but it's loose. But the reason why I do that, because it prevents burnout. And I've been on the edge of burnout twice now where it's got pretty serious, but I'm able to keep going because I'm able to change things up. I'm able to keep the variety going, but there is no way I will tell this audience what is coming like more than just like, okay, well the next lecture or the next two lectures we're talking about, I'm not even going to go even further beyond that in terms of telling people, okay, this is like seriously what's happening next. That's just not going to happen for my, for the sake of my own sanity. No, thank you. But but you're an ENTJ, right? <laughs> oh yeah, I mean you know like yeah, you know yeah okay. you'll you'll never you will never hear. We're joined tonight by famous person C.S. Joseph. Yeah, you'll never hear that. <laughs> okay, um, now I think I know the answer to this. You're going to recommend a book, but it's we seriously need a series on how each function acts in each slot. Yes, I believe that's season 16. That's right around the corner. I believe there's also a book that covers that, if you want to. Yeah, Dr. John Beebe. Read Dr. John Beebe if you want to have a, a deeper, uh, as well as research socionics. Do Dr. John Beebe and uh, uh, socionics at the same time. Dr. John Beebe, I'm spelling it out in the chat right now. Read Dr. John Beebe and read Socionics' approach to cognitive functions and their definitions, et cetera, and you'll have a better idea. But in terms of uh, what I call the cognitive attitudes of the cognitive functions, uh, their attitudes, I'll be doing uh, a season on that to do a deep dive in the very near future. And I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but when you're reading Socionics, completely ignore their compatibility. That's right. <laughs> Ignore the compatibility. <laughs> socionics is a really strong system. I just don't disagree. I do not agree with them on how socionics arrives at how to type somebody. And I do not agree with them on how they determine what types are compatible with others. I completely disagree with them on those points. Everything else is very solid. And I definitely recommend you check it out. Okay. Well, this is more of a comment than a question, but this person says that when you discuss the types, you always take it to the, the both extreme good and the extreme bad. 
Um, and this person states that most people fall in the middle. So whilst it's a lot easier to identify these extreme bad and extreme good behaviors so that, you know, you can play to your strengths or weaknesses, not everyone applies to them. So could yeah, you so. take a more, <laughs> so could you like, take a more moderate approach or something? No, I'm not going to take a moderate approach. Uh, the reason is because no one else talks about the extremes and I'm tired of no one else talking about the extremes. So I'm going to spend a good amount of time talking about the extremes. People have to understand that there is a lot of good things that come out of times. There's a lot of bad things. Who else out there basically teaches people that ENFPs can literally be the most selfish of all of the types while simultaneously ENFPs could also be the most giving of all the types in terms of how charitable right. they can be. Who else talks about that, right? No one else talks about it, so I'm gonna talk about it. It's important that people understand these things. Virtue and vice is a very, very important metric that people need to realize that is part of their psyche and part of who they are. Nobody's perfect. And this whole like, oh, I'm just gonna have this moderate approach to each of the types because you know I don't wanna hurt people's feelings and make sure everything is politically correct here. <laughs> how about I just burn down society for you so that that new life could happen and let's just activate my super ego i'll go chaotic evil joker on you and then all of a sudden there isn't a city anymore yeah that's because you know we don't allow ourselves to fall into these politically correct pitfalls so that you know people's feelings are preserved when the feelings that they have is based <laughs> on a lie to begin with let's not do that i'm not here to tell lies <laughs> sorry yeah, fair enough. I mean, like, you kind of need to know what the extremes of your negative behaviors are so you can recognize if you're doing that um, and then improve them to become a better person. Like, it's just common sense to me. But, you know, I, I understand why some people want to know what people are like in the middle when it comes to typing. But, you know, I, I definitely do agree with your approach. And with that, I'm going to go into the next question. So this is a question about IP types. If IPs are more decision-making, judging types, how does one gravi gravitate towards more productivity? Well, it depends. If they are an ISTP or an INFP, they need to like really want, actually want to be more productive. It, they have to have a desire and it has to be benefiting them first with how they feel about it. Whereas... An INP, like an INTP or an INFP, it's all about discipline. They need to force themselves to be productive. They need to realize that it is their duty to be productive, regardless of what they think or regardless of how they feel about it. And it's not about them, and it's not about their comfort zone. And if they're clinging too much to their comfort zone, well, sorry, guess what? Dumpster. I mean, <laughs> Dumpster. like, yeah, seriously, you know, we need to be responsible as human beings. That includes being productive. You know, this whole idea of like, well, I got my comfort zone. As long as I have my comfort zone handled, you know, then, I, then I'm okay. Or have the other point of view of as long as I get what I want, I'm good, right? So both, both of those are extremes and both of those are unhealthy. Not something I would recommend. Yeah. Um, if I can, yeah. I mean, uh, there's nothing more to really add to that. Uh, I'm going to do one more question from this spreadsheet and then I'm going to go back to the YouTube chat. Awesome. So <clears throat> since INFJs have ESTP subconscious, do they subconsciously want to lead a wolf back? Absolutely. Context, my best yes. friend is heightening. <laughs> <laughs> Context. My best friend is heightening and reevaluating life goals, wants to work in finance instead of yoga now. And she talked about having a stable friend group as a huge part of the reasoning. Jesus I guess Christ. the answer is yes. Jesus Christ is an INFJ. He had the 12 disciples. Oh, Wolfpack. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Answer right. yes. I mean, yeah, that's pretty much the answer. The answer is just yes. All right, let's find something in the YouTube chat. Um, do, vices ex <coughs> Sorry. do vices exist in the unaware or unconscious? How do people avoid giving into their vices? INTJ here. Yes, absolutely. Again, when we talk about the virtue and vice of each type, the virtue and vice exists specifically for that type. If you have four sides of the mind, that means you have four virtues and four vices. And don't forget, there's also secondary and tertiary <laughs> virtues and vices that are attached to basically F-I-T-E, depending what slot they're in, also to, uh, you know, uh, N-I or T-I, you know, 
it depends. Like for example, you know, ETPs, uh, ENTPs, because they have TI parent and FE child, because they have FE child, they have a nymphomania streak to them, just like ESTPs do. It's just ESTPs are the primary carrier of the nymphomania of vice, for example, right? So there's a lot more, there's a lot more dimensions to virtue and vice. It's just, I set up my lectures the way I did to talk about the primary ones for each type. But in reality, you know, uh, there's like, eight different virtues and vices in order of priority from primary to secondary to tertiary, all the way down the list till you get to the eight for both virtues and <clears> vices <throat> for each of them. And then they all connect together in this huge array of all 16 types and all of their uh, primary and, and secondary and, and sub vices and virtues, et cetera. It's a big matrix. Okay. Um, this question comes from who will you call on then? And they ask, how come every time I type myself, half of the time, half of the info is like definitely, or the other half of the info is like absolutely not? Uh, because of primary versus secondary. You want to focus on what you do primarily and not what you do secondarily, because primary, when you're looking at your primary, that's what your ego is. You're just trying to identify your ego. Right. I I'm a little bit confused as to the wording of the question because every time I type myself, it sounds like he's type he or she's typing themselves a different type every time. So perhaps watch Chase's season on typing and use that to type yourself. If you're typing yourself correctly, then it all comes down to where you're getting that information from. If you're getting information from a website like, you know, well, I'm not going to shout out any websites, but maybe the website has wrong information. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, what advice? Oh, I would like to say something okay. actually for that. Um, yep. So Linda Barons, uh, she talked. You know, she has her books, Understanding Yourself and Others. There's another source that you can use. Um, this book right here. Uh, it's uh, written by Stephen Montgomery, uh, PhD. It's called uh, People Patterns: A Popular Culture Introduction to Personality Types and the Four Temperaments. This is recommended to me by Wendy Gossett. Thank you very much for your recommendation. I enjoyed your email and your criticism. And uh, I will be reading this this weekend, and I will be posting a lecture on it this weekend as well, and, uh, which will help uh, you help this audience basically um, understand in this bonus episode, episode nine for season 15, uh, a few more dimensions behind the temperament styles and the interaction styles. So you can actually have a better handle of how to use the type grid. So we're going to be exploring that in the upcoming lecture, just so you guys are aware. So yeah. Do I smell have... another giveaway? Uh, yeah, it will be a giveaway in the future for sure. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I mean, pick up People Patterns by Stephen Montgomery. If you have additional trouble with Linda Behrens, he is a very nice approach or alternative to Linda Behrens to help give you a better idea of what to do yeah. in terms of how to type yourself. Perfect. Um, let's go to this. This is an ENFP. What advice would you have for an ENFP who's pursuing the field of embedded systems engineering? I find not many ENFPs are known for being engineers, but I don't see why it's not possible if we, <laughs> if we, and then it ends. Well, I mean, that question is a perfectly perfect example as to why I would not recommend an ENFP get involved in engineering is because they're a starter type. Starter type, when you do, when you're engineering a system, that means you have to finish the system. But then if you don't finish the system, what good is it, right? That's, that's the issue. It's very hard. And ENFPs, they could provide vision for an engineering system, but then they'd have to learn delegation similar to ENTPs to be able to finish the system, quite, quite frankly. So it's contingent on them getting a leadership position, but yes. it's going to be hard to get that leadership position until yes. they show that they can do the grunt work. Exactly. So then again, it would just come down to maturity, whether they can use the other sides of their mind and you know get out of their comfort zone. So for this person to actually work in there, in that field, they'd have to mature their subconscious or this shadow. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. Now, let's see if there's any more YouTube questions. Hmm, let's see. How do ISFJs manipulate others? 
what type of ideas would they normally latch on to be manipulative? Uh, ISFJs manipulate other people primarily through guilt. Uh, they're very all about using guilt as a weapon and uh, responsibility and your, it's your duty to do this. Uh, and they especially use any kind of system that they, you know, system or social system to do that. Cause remember SJs are systematic, right? <clears throat> and, uh, and versus not being interest or motive based, they're very systematic. So they would find a system that they, or a set of rules or whatnot that they can lord over you, basically. And uh, it's usually some kind of social system. And then they would use guilt as a weapon or, uh, you know, you should be doing this. It's your duty to do this, et cetera. Or, you know, or they do it because they're afraid of what you might become and what your future is and what and how you're going to harm people or how you're an embarrassment and blah, blah, blah. That's that's how they would typically manipulate somebody. Yeah. All right, we're going back to the Discord questions now because it looks like we've handled most of that. Okay. Um, I mean, give this one a short answer. I know you've answered it many times before, but thoughts on Enneagram? Oh, the Enneagram question every time. <laughs> yeah, there's always one. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Uh, yeah, I, I will state that I don't want to answer Enneagram questions other than this. I will say the Enneagram has a hard time differentiating between human nature and human nurture. And that is why I do not put any stock into the Enneagram. I'm not saying it's wrong, but I'm not saying it's right either. And it's just not a priority for me right now. Maybe one day it may become a priority, but it's just not a priority right now. Although I would state that I definitely like it way better than the big five or Hexaco, or some of the other of the other tests that are available. Disk system, yeah, better than the disk system, that's for sure. But uh, <laughs> yeah, like that's that's where I would leave it. Okay. Now this is uh, this is a question from Pixie C. Can you go more into the tricks tr tricks the functions and how they manifest, just like you did for any among the previous questions? The trickster function basically means that uh, your mind is trying to be aware of something, but it can't. And it tricks itself. It's like, oh, yeah, I'm aware of this. I, I'm good. Oh, I'm not because the result blew up in my face. That's basically all the trickster is. The trickster is just a black hole that exists inside your psyche, sucking that thing that it's trying to be aware of into nothingness. So for me, I have FI trickster. So that means I have a black hole inside my soul that is sucking away my humanity basically. <laughs> so effectively you think you have humanity, but realistically it's a black hole and anything that tries to hit that just gets sucked into the void. That's, that's right. Someone's like trying to like guilt me into some, or, uh, or you know, tell me that I'm a bad person. Is they're trying to manipulate me? Oh, you're not really <laughs> a good person. And just like, I don't care if I'm a good person or not. Dumpster. Yeah. Dumpster indeed. Okay, now let's go with, this is actually a good reminder, where are meetups usually held? So you, can get, you get to plug your Bay Area meetup. Uh, where are my meetups typically held? Well, we were just at Eon Coffee last week, or this week, and before that we are at another place in Union City. Uh, I'm trying to basically go everywhere uh, in the Bay Area. Uh, I can even go all the way up to Concord, all the way down to Pleasanton in the 680 corridor. And uh, I could make it all the way out to Palo Alto or Mountain View, and uh, as well as Santa Clara and uh, Milpitas, northern San Jose. Probably not going to be going to San Jose, to be honest. And, uh, you know, Union City, Hayward, and South Oakland is probably the locations that we'll be doing it at. That being said, Jab. I'd like to take the time and inform the audience that if anyone would like to help being an organizer of the meetups or would have a preference in terms of where meetups should take place and when in terms of time and scheduling and whatnot, please contact a moderator on the Discord server and get so that we can get in contact with me and we can see what you can do for us. Because 
as much as I love the meetup and it's great, I'm not able to manage it all the time. And I need someone to step up and kind of manage it for us so that we can make sure that we have a consistent schedule and having it being delivered properly. Uh, Cause I don't want to find myself burning out because I'm always worried about the meetup group, et cetera. So any way that this audience can provide some assistance, I'd appreciate it. So otherwise there you go. Mm -hmm. Okay. Ooh, we got a first timer, Mr. Nathan. Uh, okay, I've been struggling to type myself for too long. He thinks he's too biased. I've convinced myself that I'm every type at some point. Question is, is there a type most likely to do this? I.e., feels like there are many different types at different points. Basically, I will pay you to type me. Well, I mean, you could just get coaching from me and then like it doesn't matter like i've had people get coaching from me for like some of the weirdest things some of the really coolest things to be honest um but in every time I'm, I'm coaching somebody i don't care what type they tell me i find out for myself what type they actually are and then we discuss that because i'm not going to be relying on them telling me what type they are if you know what i mean so definitely not going to do that um Again, just learn how to use the type grid. You got to watch all of season two and you have to watch all of season 15. And uh, an episode nine is coming out for season 15 this weekend. I'm hoping to get it out this weekend. And uh, it'll be the Steve, the Stephen Montgomery method, um, uh, you know, which is similar to uh, it's kind of the same as Linda Barron's, but it just provides additional context to help you navigate the type grid, basically. Speaking of the type grid, I met with the graphic artist this morning and it is getting adjusted. So we got about two or three more, probably two more proofs, maybe three more proofs on it. And then uh, we'll have that out to the community here very soon. Thank you for your patience on that. Can confirm, I've seen it, looks good. Um, let's move on to the next question. Certain types are more compatible together. Does which is male and which is female play into this? Uh, I'm not going to answer that question. I do know the answer to that question, but I will not be answering that question because that will preclude uh, some of my romantic compatibility lectures that will be coming out in the near future. The audience is just going to have to wait right. before I answer that question. <laughs> so you're going to violate your rule for your lecture schedule and just tell your audience that you're going to be doing a romantic in the future. Well, I'm not going to say specifically when, but yes, it is coming. Thank <laughs> yeah. you for your patience. <laughs> okay. Um, INFJs are known for experiencing an NITI loop when they are not socializing for a lengthy period of time. It's basically overthinking or rumination. And as an INFJ, I go through this a lot. Does this access exist? And if so, can you explain this further? So the NITI loop. NITI loop. Yeah, I mean... Any cognitive function can team up with any other cognitive function. I mean, you even have your like inner child, your child function teaming up with the demon. It's called the demonic child. We also have the demonic parent, for example. Like that can happen. Uh, well, uh, overthinking does happen, but really all you have to do to stop yourself from overthinking in that way is to activate or use your uh, FE parent and just go ask people how they feel about what you think. That's it. Hey, I have these ideas. How do you feel about them? That's all you have to do. Just ask people how they feel about what you're thinking and ask for their moral guidance because going to an FI user and asking them how they feel, they're going to give you a TE rational response, which is going to help you organize your thoughts. You're going to think better about it and you're going to be able to weigh out your thoughts better and then you're actually going to be more effective at it. Use your FE parent. Usually if you get stuck in an NITI loop, that basically means you have not developed your FE parent and you need to spend time developing your FE parent, being more socially aware as a result. Okay. Now this person's asked, how can I de develop my FE as an INTP female? I've had a rough childhood and experienced a lot of social anxiety growing up. I say this because I want to be much more emotionally available for my children when I have them, then my parents were for my sister, an INFJ. Uh, surround yourself with FI users, basically, and then interact <laughs> with FI users on a regular basis and measure their reactions. And then use your SI child to remember it with long-term memory how certain things you did worked and how certain things did not work. That's how to do it by yourself. 
Otherwise, uh, uh, find people who are FI child or FI inferior because those people will react the least negative to you so that you can further develop your extroverted feeling um, inferior. But otherwise, just keep forcing yourself to keep trying and fail over and over and over again until you get it right, basically. You're, like, there's yeah. no reason to be afraid of social interaction and besides if you're focusing on being supportive of these other people that you're interacting with if you're actually give, showing them value if you're actually doing something good for them if you are doing something valuable to them and they have told you that it is valuable then what business do they have to complain about you doing a social faux pas when you're already being so useful to them right so think about it that way make yourself <clears throat> useful be supportive doesn't matter if you make a social faux pas because if you're already supportive people will just overlook that all right next qu question comes from Cruz. which times are more prone to become a mr nice guy uh all of them <laughs> wouldn't sc inferiors and sc childs be more prone though with that performance anxiety they want to please they're insecure about it overcompensate become a nice guy no, all of them, because ENPs can get stuck in their comfort zone, uh, and uh, ESTJs and ENTJs are afraid that they're bad people, so they compensate by trying to be as nice as possible because they're afraid they're a bad person, for example. It's everybody. <laughs> Anyone who has an inferior right. version is at risk of being a nice guy. <laughs> Which so is it's all about the maturity developing that in, that inferior it's, function so you know it's, it's, about level, it. it's level of maturity it's how much self-respect you have if again this audience if you have not watched my lecture series about the four pillars of self-intimacy and you want to understand how maturity works you need to watch the entire lecture series i forget what season is it might be season six ish I don't know, but it's on it's on the YouTube channel. Go to the playlist, find whichever season is labeled the four pillars of self intimacy. Watch it. It's all about maturity and how to get maturity. So please check that out so you can understand. And while you're at it, watch season four, which is how intimate relationships actually work. They both link to each other and they both talk about maturity. And uh, it's very important that you understand these things so that you can be more successful in your life. What's next? Okay. Now this person is asking, is it possible to develop more personal types outside of four inside the circle using parent functions of the super ego? So I think what this person is asking is, can you develop your functions beyond the four sides of the mind? But I think that comes down to emulation. If you want uh, to expand on that. The answer to that question is yes, but you would have to be immortal to do that. And Ooh. until that happens, the answer is going to be no. And uh, otherwise, uh, and that gets into like major metaphysics and I'm not gonna go in that direction tonight. Maybe someday later, uh, maybe at like a meetup group, uh, cause I don't often like talking that deep metaphysics in this type of forum. Uh, but other than that, uh, the answer really is no. Uh, when you're, once you got your four sides to your mind, it is what it is now. If you are a child and you have not gone through adolescence yet, you can change your quadra, which can open you up to other things. But after adolescence or if you're undergoing trauma, you're stuck and you're solidified. And then that's that you're, you have your four sides of your mind, basically. So. OK. <clears throat> All right. And now this next question is from Valentina again. Belovsky. How can you deal with an ENTP family member who acts apathetic and can be present with you at times when you need them to? Huh. And can't be, sorry, and can't be present with you at times you need them to. Well, <laughs> that the answer to that question is uh, you have to obligate them to, basically. You have to obligate them to, and you have to make sure that they understand that there will be negative consequences if they are not there. I mean, especially like if you're parenting an ENTP, like you need to, you need to put up boundaries and restrictions on them consistently. Like just don't buy an ENTP a car because then their SI <laughs> inferior will expect a car. You know what I mean? If you do buy them a car, make sure your name is on the title of that car so you can take away that car at will if you have to. Because you always have to be like, hey, 
you are supposed to be responsible, right? As an ENTP having this car. And uh, I need to know that I can take away this car from you in case you become irresponsible with said car. Same thing is with turning off the data on their phone if you're paying for their phone, for example. But it also teaches them personal responsibility because it's like, oh, hey, you know, you can always get a job and earn your own money if you don't want these things. See, that's the thing. ENTPs get so stuck in their comfort zone that they're comfortable being dicks to other people, basically. So you have to make them uncomfortable when they're being dicks to other people. And uh, that's basically where that is. I was very uncomfortable being dicks to other people for so long after I realized they alienated everybody, including my own family and including like people in my own community. Of course, they also alienated me at the same time. So it's kind of like, well, who's right? But the point is something has to stop the flow. Someone has to be willing to stand up and be like, hey, you know, fairness is important, but we're still human beings at the end of the day. Am I going to forgive these people or not? I know some really super bitter ENTPs to this day who still are quick to point the finger at everyone else instead of taking responsibility for their own actions. And uh, yeah, not fun. Okay. Well, you kind of already answered the next question, which was like, how does an ENTP deal with arrogance? So I think we can skip over that one. Yeah, let's skip that one. Um, we've got a question from an INTJ. Would culture impact how a type would typically behave? For instance, would an INTP from Western society behave differently from an INTP from the Middle East? So on and so forth. Absolutely. Human nurture definitely changes a type in such a way uh, where there are different decisions being done. But they still are who they are based on the interaction styles and the temperament styles. But what they're behaving, they're just behaving based on the culture that they're in or the cultural biases that they have to deal with on a regular basis that either are for them or against them, essentially. Okay. Um, so Emery asks, is control movement, comma, responding, initiating, comma, informative, direct, a spectrum or more of a dichotomy? There seemed to be more talk on the server about a spectrum, but I do not see that mentioned in the videos. Uh, it's more of a dichotomy, but again, it can look like a spectrum if you're combining all four sides of the mind and measuring how often the mind slips into which side of the mind at what given point in time during the day. Right. So it's all about a sample size, a yep. sample size of discrete variables, and you need to pick the one with the most to determine what the ego is. That's correct. And we do not have the technology that can measure that yet, but I am working on it. <laughs> okay. Uh, do interaction styles influence the way cognitive functions present? For example, would Effie Hero differ from informative Effie Hero? If Absolutely. so, would this apply to temperaments in the same way? Yes, 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 yes. Yes, interaction styles can make cognitive functions behave slightly different. Yes. That's why okay. tests that that's why tests that test just cognitive functions are not very good. And that's why I focus on using interaction styles and temperament styles and the type grid to type somebody accurately because good luck finding a test or even making a test that is all cognitive functions. This is why Bale's test, you know, who is a very NITI test is trying to identify cognitive function stacks using photos and questions, et cetera. But I mean, it wasn't exactly always accurate. Some people would say it was only accurate half the time, for example, and not saying that his test is wrong. It could use some work and I'm sure it would be really good in the future, but until then, you know, like, it's 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 not the most efficient or the quickest way. Going for a Stephen Montgomery or a Linda Barron's approach is definitely superior in terms of accuracy, effectiveness, and speed. And cost. All right. So we're up to about the 16th of August for questions. Do you want to blitz out the rest? Um, 16th of August for questions. Uh... Oh, do you want to? I think there's some more questions. I think there's some more questions in the YouTube channel. Raylan, way back, asked a question. Let's see if I can find it because that's where we left off I'm trying to find yep. it here. Maybe you can find it before me. I don't know. 
Uh, <laughs> oh, there's the there's the SE demon. There's the SE demon question before that from Neurotic Alpha. And then I'm just verifying here. Oh, is Gordon Ramsay really an ENTJ by Jess Lee? Let's go. And yeah, that's where we left off. The Gordon Ramsay question by Jess Lee. Um, so did you find that one, Jab? Uh, is there a search function? <laughs> No, uh, I I pinged Jess Lee yes, right after it. that. Yeah. So the answer to that yep. question is, is Gordon yes. Ranzi, yep. Yeah. So let's Gordon Ramsay is an ETJ. Yeah. You see the SE rage? Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah, just go down from there and let's let's continue on. All right. Um, hi. Can you explain what each of the items in the four sides of the mind, i.e., Nemesis, Critic, Trickster, Demon, Morality, Physics, Willpower, etc. I'm quite clear on items in the ego. So uh, that's, that's, I'm guessing if you were to do that, it's that's a lecture. Season, that's season 16. That's about to come out. Uh, so we'll just have to wait till that season for that. Cheers, Joseph. I'm an ENTJ. How do I get Mr. ISTJ to make decision weeks faster while showing him respect and not being rude? That's Raylan's question. Yes, that's a very difficult question. And I, and I will answer it. Uh, <laughs> So this is assuming this is so this is for Raylan. This is assuming uh, that uh, Raylan is an ENTJ with an ISTJ uh, uh, boyfriend or husband, et cetera, and in a romantic relationship with this ISTJ. So basically, you have to make the ISTJ comfortable. You have to preface what you say. You go up to him and just like, hey, uh, you know, there's this thing I need. You have to stay why you state why you need the decision made sooner. Uh, and uh, you got to make him comfortable doing it, and you have to immediately state why you want it and why it is a responsible decision as to what you want. Because ISTJs are very afraid of what you want. He's afraid of you wanting the wrong thing. He's afraid that what you want is going to cause harm. So you have to explain it to him in very small pieces, uh, because NI parent can be very can be overwhelming for uh, NE inferior. But if you take time and are patient with him and explain it to him in a better way, then uh, he would come to understand. Although ISTJs are typically movement, but the thing is, what can stop the movement is comfort. Do they feel safe in making the decision, right? So here's one way that you can be, make them feel safe and comfortable. Use your SE child, do some additional research, and prove to the ISTJ that, oh, hey, these other people over here were successful as a result of making this decision. Why aren't we making this decision? We see that it works for these people over here. So let's make this decision then. And uh, then, then they'd be like, okay, yeah, sure. The problem is, is the fact that you're TE hero and he's TE parent. And it's like, okay, well, how do we know what's actually true? So because you have higher TI than him in your relationship, it's technically slightly on you to verify more often than him. Technically, that's negotiable, hashtag debatable. Which means when you're doing your research, you're going to have to spend that much more time verifying said research for him because he's not going to verify it for you. Which means you're going to have to have multiple sources uh, of people making this decision and being successful. He's not going to just work on a theory. He's not going to make a decision based on what if. He has to have concrete what is in order for him to feel comfortable to do that. And once you have made him comfortable enough with all those things and you've answered all of his questions and he feels good about it, which is super hard for an ENTJ to make an ISTJ feel good about anything, quite frankly. But you can do that as long as you just focus on the research, focus on the verification of said research and do it while in a respectful and, comf and comforting manner uh, to him while prefacing what you say. It's a lot of effort, but it can be done is my point. And that's how I would approach your ISTJ to be able to get them to make decisions faster. It's because you're spending that much more time doing all of the extra legwork because mentally what's happening in his head is that you're not doing all that extra mental leg legwork because it doesn't even occur to ENTJs that they would even have to do that extra legwork, right? But because he's an ISTJ, he's being like, well, crap, she didn't do all this extra legwork, so I'm going to have to do all this extra legwork 
And then that's what's going to cause me to have to spend more time in making the decision before I'm comfortable and feel safe enough to actually make that decision. This is why ISTJs go very well with ESTPs because ESTPs naturally do all of that legwork for them ahead of time because they already, their top priority is making their ISTJ feel comfortable. Their, their next priority is always making sure that everything that they look at is 100% verified. And they're already aware of what other people are doing and that other people have already been successful. And because they know other people have been successful, they want to do it. And the ISTJ is already getting the benefit of the ESTP already doing all of those things specifically for them, right? But this is not something naturally an ENTJ does. So that's why it comes off to an ENTJ woman that he's taking forever and making decisions when the reality of the situation is he's taking forever because he's having to do all this extra legwork that an ESTP or an ISTP naturally would do for him in a relationship that an ENTJ is not doing for him in a relationship, right? So it's not actually technically his fault. He's just being wise. And because of that, wise from his point of view, because of that, it's taking a lot more time to be able to make those decisions. So hopefully that answers your question. Okay, uh, let's move on to the next question. What about the demon function? I have SE demon. How does this affect me as an ENTP? Uh, can you ask that again, demon? How, how does the SE demon manifest for the ENTP? Is that what that is? Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's the reset button. It's the uh, it's like um, the Joker, the chaotic evil Joker. Heath Ledger's portrayal of the Joker in the movie The Dark Knight. If you haven't watched that film, you probably should. Uh, there's also some other good ENTP films where that's shown. Uh, uh, Leonardo DiCaprio's portrayal of uh, Howard Hughes in The Aviator is also an excellent uh yes bus driver yes yes bus driver um that's another example uh but uh the joker um his whole point was is that reality i mean he's abused by his father he's a war veteran uh, the reality of life is so bad is so bad that you know what i'm just going to burn down this reality because after it's burnt down maybe a better reality could come so as demon comes out it's like the nuclear option it wipes all of reality around you and resets it so that new life can grow and you can have a new life and when you activate your super ego you better be willing to burn down your entire life you better be willing to throw away every relationship you have with your family with your children with your spouse with your church with your everything so that you can become quote a new man basically be careful, though, because when people are not in their right mind and they activate their superego, they are liable of committing heinous crimes like murder and rape and pedophilia and other horrible, horrible behaviors because of, uh, you know, and I think a really good example of this from anime was in this anime called Psychopaths, actually. And I think it's like the first or second episode <laughs> where this guy has such a horrible, horrible life and he hates life. He hates his life. And then he activates his superego and then he like tries to rape a woman before committing suicide right so that's a very good example of you know a super ego activation going wrong so make sure that when you're doing your super ego activation you know it's like when people someone what's like when someone fakes their own death that's a super ego activation right there they're literally resetting their life that is the point of the super ego used healthily is resetting your life obviously faking your death is not something i would recommend you do but the point is <laughs> It's being done in an attempt to reset your life. That's what the superego is for. It's very powerful. It is demonic. It is a parasite. It literally is attached to your soul like a disease, rotting your soul from the inside out because it's trying so hard to replace the ego. So what you have to do to manage it is flip it a few scraps every now and then. Otherwise, if you ignore it, it'll eventually come out of your ca its cage and it'll just like blow up on somebody close to you in your life. And all of a sudden you've ended a relationship. You don't even know what you just did. Right. And it's like, well, I was not in the right mind when I did that. Well, yeah, because you're in your super ego mm -hmm. using your super ego responsibly. You just have to kind of realize that you have to be willing to go all the way in your life, burn it down so that you can rebuild it because you always have to have the intention to rebuild. And one way that we can look on this 
you have to have faith. You have to have faith in yourself that you can actually do this. And this is exemplified in my uh, lecture series, The Four Pillars of Self-Intimacy. And the first pillar is taking responsibility for meeting your own needs. And some of the needs that you have is faith, family, fitness, finance, and friends, also known as living by the fist, okay? And if you have those five needs uh, in place, then you're able to, that's the first pillar, the next one, standards, boundaries, and then goals. And then all of a sudden you have self-respect. So as long as you have developed a huge amount of self-respect for yourself, activating the superego usually yields healthy results because you're not going to let go of your self-respect while you're using your superego. Superego activations gone wrong is when you've like basically let go of your self-respect essentially and you're willing to let go of your self-respect because what what self-respecting person activates their superego and all of a sudden they're a murderous pedophile yeah no thank you see they lack self-respect right <laughs> So, so you just have to understand, you have to use your superego with caution, but understand what it's there for and why it exists and why SE demon is the gateway function into it, essentially. So. Okay. The next question we've got from Flavio Caffarello. And he says, hey, Joseph, I am an ENTJ and I live in an SFP culture. That made me change a lot. That, uh, that made me change a lot of that ENTJ roughness. Sometimes I don't even feel like an ENTJ. Is that set around? Is that possible? It's me, Flavio. Uh, cringe. Yes. Yeah, I know. <laughs> like, like Max cringe. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, yes, it, it can, uh, but not not really. Uh, ENTJs are so counterculture to most cultures that all they care about is their freedom, and they will get it no ma one way or another. <laughs> so, uh, verify that you are an ENTJ first uh, before coming to that conclusion, and use the type grid to do so. But uh, until then, uh, yes, it was an epic N sixty four fail. Yes. <laughs> Anyway, uh, that's how I would answer that question. All right. Uh, I think we just get through the rest of these YouTube questions and we wrap it up. We've almost approached two hours. And yeah, I think, you know, <laughs> I, I completely agree with you. Let's let's do it. All right. Let's 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 do these. Is it a good idea for an INTP to want to sorry, to want to become a personal trainer to help others since their subconscious is ESFJ? Or is it better is it better for them to do a job that's systemic? Sorry, systematic because of their TI. Uh, the answer is yes, both actually, uh, they should be doing both simultaneously and you, you, right. you would do the gym approach for the ESFJ, you do the other approach for your TI, use both simultaneously. It's a sign of you being an integrated and very mature person. So actually seek to achieve the same goal, but with using both <laughs> vectors. Absolutely. I recommend that. And that helps you with integration for sure. Especially, <clears throat> especially if this is like an INTP who's like 45 plus years old definitely something i would recommend they do sooner than later for sure all right um is it fair to say that the ego is a resting point also how can we learn more about the matthews to calculate things like social compatibility i'm a big fan your work and all you do for us uh yes the ego is can be seen as a resting point that is correct as the as for the rest of that uh question i'm not sure how to answer that so i'm not going to <laughs> um, uh, Jess Lee asks Is it weird to enjoy random disturbances Such drama in my life while most people don't I'm an, IN, I'm an ISFP And sometimes I get excited when random inconveniences Happen because I get bored <clears throat> That's a very odd question Because uh, I've known some ISFPs When they get extremely raging Mad when there's random inconveniences on them they could be maybe an esfp but i'm not entirely sure hmm. okay uh sorry. how to be a better leader in my i uh, sorry yeah yeah i mean i didn't exactly answer that really well but i let's let's table that one for later or maybe that person can ask that question a different way in the future we'll see 
Uh, right. They do okay. love drama. I mean, Adrian Bartlett, who's uh, in the in the YouTube chat right now, and she's also one of our past uh, book winners. Uh, so thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, <laughs> she is right. ISFPs do like drama sometimes, and they can be serious drama queens, even the men. And uh, they they they're very informative in that way. Um, but to be fair, out of the background types, uh, the the most dramatic are the INPs. Uh, the The level of gossip of INPs is kind of second to none. I believe it or not, actually, I know some INFPs that are way more gossipy than ENFPs. I know, and it's just always interesting to watch. So, bit of a tangent, but uh, it's what uh, Adrian <coughs> reminded me of. What's next? All right. Um, how to be a better leader in my future company. When I'm an introvert, idealist, INFP, and cute, in quotation marks, woman, how can I create the productive synergy in my team in respect to my person? That's a great question. Okay, so uh, two ways. Uh, one is, under the first way is understanding leadership. So we're going to answer this question with nurture and then nature. So naturally, naturally speaking, leadership. We already talked about this tonight. Leadership is defined by transferring power to other human beings and then holding them accountable, a.k.a. delegation. Learn how to delegate. So INFPs who have really good mastery of accounting and project management can become absolute fantastic leaders in any company. All they have to do is create a list of tasks. Use their any parent to brainstorm a list of tasks that need to be done with each component or each department of their company or their team and then prioritize them and then after they've been prioritized delegate them to each individual person that is best able to naturally and qualified wise to handle that thing do not rely on credentials do not rely on titles do not rely on anything actually find out what type they are and assign them tasks which are better for their type to actually be able to handle and also understand that from a team standpoint if you do not know how to handle a team from an HR standpoint, you need to read the book, The Ideal Team Player, because, okay, now we're talking about nature. Naturally speaking, INFPs become amazing leaders when they read. They are amazing at anything. They become brilliant academics, some of the, the most brilliant academics, actually, as a result of constant reading. Uh, same with ISTJs, same with ENFPs, uh, same with ESTJs. That quadra of those four types can be the most brilliant academics if they actually devote themselves to reading books. Um, and uh, INFPs are no exception. So one book they need to read is The Ideal Team Player. And another book that this INFP should read is also Lean Startup by Eric Ries. Uh, read both of those. Also, How to Win Friends and Influence People. And then uh, understand the type grid. Learn how to type your colleagues. Uh, delegate those tasks to them properly. You know, Utilize the leadership model that I've just stated. And then also, get out of your comfort zone. Do not allow your comfort zone to get in the way of the execution of your company. Uh, now, this is why you probably want to work with an ENTJ to help you with execution or even an INTJ to help you with execution. NTJs are great for execution. So bring them on your team and then just and it would probably be best for an INFP to work with an ENTJ because they have SE child and SE child can make SI child comfortable. Um, also, the INFP needs to let go of all preconceived notions because preconceived notions is the number one thing that inhibits INFPs from being successful in any leadership position or any leadership leadership role whatsoever, much less an entrepreneur or somebody who owns or runs a company or is high up in a company. Preconceived notions, as well as normalcy bias, is the killer of INFPs and their effectiveness to lead. You have to get rid of all preconceived notions and just realize that up is down and two plus two equals five, for example. You have to have a paradigm shift completely so that you understand and renew your mind in that way. Uh, so that you know, so that you have the ability to be wise, because preconceived notions is what actually inhibits you from making wise decisions. Because tradition is the corpse of wisdom. Tradition does not necessarily mean it's wise. Now, traditions usually come as a, as a result of wisdom, but after a while, they get stale and they just need to be thrown into the dumpster with all the other trash in the world. 
because that's why traditions <laughs> need to be changing and not like enforced on people forever. And this is why ends typically resist SJs because of that problem. The thing is with INFPs, they have ESTJ subconscious, which ends up enforcing these traditions, especially in a business setting, because guess what? If you always do what you've always done, you will always get what you've always had. You cannot allow tradition, the corpse of wisdom, to be something that you utilize in running a company, especially as an INFP. You have to be able to cast vision and delegate it to people who can execute without allowing your preconceived no notions or your comfort zone to get in the way. So hopefully that uh, allows you to uh, kind of see a different way of doing things. Oh, and by the way, uh, Warren Buffett is constantly reading all the time and being aware of new ways of doing things and has been doing that for a long time. So he's able to keep his edge and stay on the cutting edge with how he makes decisions. While he is a traditionalist, sure, it doesn't necessarily you know, mean that he's not staying up to date on what's current. Because one of the reasons why he's been able to be so successful is because he's constantly renewing his mind with new information on a regular basis. He's even admitted this to himself on, you know, all the time. So anyway, um, I think I think that's it for us tonight, uh, Jab. Uh, you want to go ahead and wrap it up? Uh, before we do, I think there's one thing you missed. She put okay. cute in inverted commas, so I get the impression that she's concerned that because she's a cute woman that people will perceive her ability to lead as being less. Do you have any comment on that? Um, no. Uh, honestly, that can be seen as a pre preconceived notion, and that's very TE inferior. Uh, don't be afraid of what other people think about you. If you know for it, like, so... When you're, when you're working with others, you want to have at least a close TI user, preferably an ENFJ, to be honest, or a uh, even an INFJ. You may even be able to get away with an ESTP in this regard, but have that TI cl user close to you to actually verify what you know. And they'll also give you, with their extroverted feeling, you know, they'll, they'll keep their hand on the pulse or the heartbeat of your team, especially at your business, so that you can always ask them questions in case you're afraid, you know, someone might think of you less because you're a woman or a cute woman in this way and not being able to do this. And then they will tell you, this TI user will be able to tell you, oh, hey, you know, you'll be able to, uh, you know, this person said this and, you know, and, and it'll verify what you know. That way you're not at risk of falling in those preconceived notions or you know, becoming a, a, a social at risk of becoming a social justice warrior at work because you're concerned about equality instead of actually getting work done. Because the majority of the time, that's not actually a problem. If you're the if you're an authority figure and you're making those decisions, uh, and you're the one providing the job, I mean, sorry, like, you know if you're concerned about people thinking that you just got there because you're lucky or because you're cute, then they probably shouldn't be working with you to begin with. And you'd know that when you read the book, the ideal team player, it actually outlines that out a lot, especially uh, workplace uh, sexism, because there's a particular characters in the book, um, you know, like a, a woman who is a foreman, who is a manager and has to deal with a lot of that stuff on a regular basis and how she deals with it and how they are able to verify those situations and get rid of those employees and bring in employees that don't have that mindset, for example. Okay, perfect. Um, let's start wrapping it up. Thank you guys for joining in. Uh, thanks for thanks for submitting the questions. Um, sorry we didn't get to all of them. We actually had a much longer session today. I think we're approaching almost two hours right now. So just to rehash, we're going to have a competition on Instagram, which is going to be a coaching session. Chase is also going to be giving away a book. Sorry, which book was that, Chase, again? Uh, I'm giving away King Warrior Magician Lover uh, by Robert Moore and Douglas Gillette. And on Instagram, uh, look for the post this weekend. We're going to be doing a giveaway for a coaching session. Uh, you just have to be a follower of the Instagram, like uh, the specific post that says, you know, giveaway on it. And then uh, also leave a comment as well uh, to be entered to win. And then uh, someone on staff here at CSJ will uh, 
we'll end up randomly choosing who who wins and then we'll get your contact details and and go for it so uh also to enter to win the king warrior magician lover thing all you have to do i think it's within the last two lectures specifically just be a subscriber to the youtube channel uh leave a comment and a like on one of those lectures and you're automatically entered to win as well uh for that book and uh, we're going to keep doing giveaways so <laughs> Uh, yep, and just some comment on that. That's the book on the mature ma masculine. Even if you are a woman, it's still something that you could read so that you understand the expectations to hold your partner to in a romantic relationship. Hashtag uh, accountability. Exactly. It's it's exactly like the uh, memoir, Mister Nice Guy book. You you have the knowledge to hold your partner accountable. So it's still something you should read if you're a woman. Uh, Beyond that, I think with regard to the Discord server, we're going to be a bit more stricter with some people because Actually, we don't everyone. want it to become... Pretty stricter well, with everyone. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I was being a bit euphemistic there. Fair enough. Uh, we're going to be a bit stricter because, I mean, here we are preaching against man-children and trying to teach people you need to grow up, become mature so that you can grow as a person and impact society in a positive way. And then we've got people coming on and just doing some high school level, like it's not even good trolling. Like I used to be a troll and it's like two out of 10 trolling. So uh, it's not that great. So we're going to be probably shutting that down a bit more. So if you, if, if you were at all concerned that the discord was getting a bit too toxic, uh, feel free to come back. And... I think that is all for now. Um, oh, uh, the book you're giving away, King Warrior, Magician Lover, uh, you're going to be giving that away on a video, I think? Yeah, yeah. I already, I, already, I already explained to everyone how they can get in on that, so we're good there. Yep. Sweet. And that's all. Thank you all for listening, and good night, ladies and gentlemen. Have a good night, and I'll see you all later.